Here now is Faith to Live By with Pastor Barber. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, the Apostle Paul tells us that we have been bought with a price. And then the Apostle Peter steps forward in his first letter, chapter 1, and he says that that price was the blood of Christ, precious blood indeed. Here is the male quartet to sing, Now I Belong to Him. The Bible has the answer. You have provided the questions and we search the scriptures in order to find the answers. Question number one, would the Bible approve of lottery tickets? Another viewer wrote in to say, what is your opinion of lottery tickets? I would rather go to the Bible rather than give my own opinion. In 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and the first two verses, the Apostle Paul says, Let a man regard us in this manner as servants of Christ and stewards of the mysteries of God. We are servants and we are stewards. And a steward is to be one who is faithful in all that is placed under his or her charge. And so I think that it is extremely inconsistent that a person would consider themselves a servant of Christ and a steward of the mysteries of God and then being run, then running out to buy lottery tickets where lady luck is the one who is in charge it is really a question of who are you trusting and who's counsel are you listening to? The counsel of this world or are you concerned with the things of God? In Proverbs chapter 23 and verse 5, 
speaks of money, when you set your eyes on it, it is gone, for wealth certainly makes itself wings like an eagle that flies towards the heavens. It is something that is here and gone, and that we are not to set our minds, our hearts upon it. Rather, James chapter 1 and verse 27 tells us, Pure and undefiled religion in the sight of our God and Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their distress, and to keep oneself unstained by the world. And that is a good, good wor word if there is anything that speaks of our worldly mindset and of getting ahead of things and using this world to our own selfish advantage, it is most certainly lottery tickets. Question number two, what are the right words to use in prayer? I'm always concerned when someone uses very flowery language in prayer, but their own life does not line up. It is inconsistent with all the fancy verbiage, the language that they are uttering. It may be filled with the language of the Bible, but there is not that heart. There is not that deep inner within. But the Bible does speak to us about various points about prayer. For instance, John chapter 14 and verses 13 and 14, Jesus says, Whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, so that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. A vital part of prayer is praying in the name, in the authority of Jesus Christ himself that we do not come in our own authority, but we are acknowledging that we have this privilege and this opportunity because of Jesus Christ. I also want to take you to Luke chapter 18 and verses 11 to 14, and this is the account of two men who went to prayer. One who was very well known for his religious life, he was a Pharisee, and the other was a tax collector, one who was scorned. The Pharisee, he used all the right words, but he was really just praying to himself, and he was elevating himself in God's eyes, so he thought, certainly in his own eyes, and he was lifting himself above the tax collector. The tax collector, he prayed the most simple prayer saying, God be merciful to me the sinner. Prayer is really about our heart condition. It is really about what is going on within rather than flowery language. And so just cry out to the Lord and call upon his name and pour out your heart before the Lord. That is the best prayer of all. And the best prayer is also not public prayer, but that which is done in your closet, in the secret place. If you want good instruction about how to pray and the things which should be heavy upon our hearts in prayer, I'd encourage you to take Paul as your example at the outset of pretty much every letter, every epistle that Paul wrote, he begins with prayer. Soak yourself there. Or in the Old Testament, in the Psalms, so many of the Psalms are a prayer to God. And again, get your heart beating in time with Paul and with the psalmist, and you will indeed pray well. Thank you for these questions. If you have a question, send it to us. And our mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. Tim Sturby now comes singing, Come, Come Ye Saints, and that is followed by the mailed quartet once again, Peace Like a River. No toil, no labor. 
CD presentation is entitled, God So Loved the World. Of course, that is a reference to John chapter 3 and verse 16. This new CD project includes 13 songs, two of them by the full group and others by smaller ensembles. It is a blessing to be able to send this to you, and we trust that you are blessed by each of these that we produce. Let me list just a few of the titles. Saved by grace, now I belong to him. Jesus paid it all, pass me not. Have you any room for Jesus? His name lives on and seven more. We are always pleased to send these out free and postage paid simply upon your request. Ask for your copy when you write this week to Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6, or call us toll-free at 1-833-367-3852. Also, 
Our website, faithtoliveby.ca, has a means of you indicating you would like us to mail one of these CDs to you, or you may immediately download the audio files to your tablet, phone, or computer that you might begin listening to them right away. Now, just before the message, here is Heidi and Dorothy to sing from this CD, His Name Lives On. I want to take you again to Isaiah chapter 53 today, but first to Philippians chapter 2. It is called the kenosis passage, where Paul speaks of how that Christ emptied himself, but that now he is highly exalted. Philippians chapter 2 and verse 7 Christ emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also, God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God. Jesus emptied himself, but now he has been highly exalted above every other name 
that could be or have has ever been, he is exalted. This is the tone and this is the thrust of what we find as we come to the conclusion of Isaiah's great chapter 53, which 700 years before Jesus would be born in Bethlehem, Isaiah saw with remarkable clarity the character and the life of Jesus Christ, his ministry, his sacrificial death, all laid out before him. I take you to the last three verses, beginning with Isaiah chapter 53, verse 10. The Lord, God the Father, was pleased to crush him. So many marvel at that, and marvel we should that the Father in such love for your soul and for mine that he would crush his own son. The Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Oh, the anguish of his sinless soul that he bore your penalty and mine to put him to grief. If he would render himself as a guilt offering, he will see his offspring. He will prolong his days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in his hand. Because Christ was willing to humble himself, and that there was no depth that he was not willing to go to, even the death the ignoble, the hideous death upon a cross such as that of Calvary, that he was willing to step down from heaven's glory to the manger of Bethlehem, to live in the carpenter's shop there in Nazareth, then to walk with 12 disciples who by and large did not clue in as to exactly what was going on, oh, how they had their own thoughts, how they had their own agendas, how they bickered with one another about who was the greatest among them. Jesus, he comes and he descends into this world and he descends to die a scorned, a cursed death, but it was for the purpose of the good pleasure of the Lord prospering in his hand. Verse 11, as a result, you see, this wasn't a mindless endeavor. There was a purpose, there was a specific plan of God that had been worked out in eternity past for this to take place as a result of the anguish of his soul it was not for no purpose. He will see it and be satisfied. By his knowledge, the righteous one, my servant, will justify the many as he will bear their iniquities. Oh, how good it is that God has a plan. We wouldn't know where to start, but God, he was working out in the Garden of Eden and even before, he was working out that we might be able to come back to him. We who had been outcasts, we who had been on the other side of an impenetrable wall, we who had been outside of that heavy veil in the temple, not able to gain access into the presence of God, but God made it possible through Jesus Christ, he will see it and be satisfied. Jesus' death was the means of doing something that nothing else could have accomplished. Now the last verse of Isaiah 53, verse 12. Therefore, I will allot him a portion with the great. God the Father speaking with pride of his son, speaking of how that he will give into his son's hands all things, even as we read in Revelation. I will allot him a portion with the great, and he will divide the booty with the strong, 
Because he poured out himself to death. There it is once again. This theme that reverberates all the way through this chapter and all the way through the sacred page, wherever it is found here in these covers, that the death of Jesus Christ was what was necessary. It was the all-important work of God in bringing you to salvation. Because he poured himself out to death and was numbered with the transgressors, that's you. You were a transgressor. You were dead in your trespasses and sins. You were like a filthy rag before a holy God. You were an offshoot. You were, you were thrown aside. But God, he comes and he says, oh, I want that one in my kingdom. I want that one to dwell with me for all eternity. Don't you hear the love of God for your lost soul and that he has quickened you and that he has brought you to life? He poured himself out to death in order that you might not die. You were dead in your trespasses and sins, but he brought you alive never to die. He was numbered with the transgressors, yet he himself bore the sin of many. It was not just for the disciples. It was not just for a chosen few there in the first century, but it was for you. It was for you reaching all the way down to today and interceded for transgressors, even as he stands at the right hand of God the Father now. He has bought you. Would you surrender to him? Oh, what a tragedy it is when people, they hear about Christ having purchased their salvation and they live as rebels. They kick and they fight. Would you come and would you surrender yourself to him today? And would you rejoice in the love that he has had for you? And would you dwell and rejoice evermore before your God? Yes, there's room at the cross for you. Thank you for joining Pastor Barber today. Please watch for Faith to Live By again next Sunday at this same time on this same station. Until then, Faith to Live By prays that the peace of God will fill your heart and that the joy of the Lord will be your strength. Pastor Barber would love to hear from you. The mailing address is Faith to Live By, Box 426, Winnipeg, Manitoba, R3C2H6. 